Okay, and I think we are live. Usually I like to wait a few moments for people who are joining us, welcome. We're just gonna wait a couple of minutes to see if some folks jump on. I don't think anyone is watching yet. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. Oh, wow, the whole bunch of people just jumped on. <laughs> Hi, everybody, I'm Ariel. You guys have probably seen my face before if you've tuned into one of the Arteries previous living room live streams. I um, am the arts engagement producer for the Artery. We are the arts and culture vertical over at WBUR. So um, yes, that's me. And today I'm very excited to have an amazing local artist and educator here. Um, he was part of our Artery 25 series last year. If you happen to catch that, where we highlighted 25 millennials of color, changing the art landscape here in Boston. He is just an amazing person all around and he's gonna be leading us through a really cool fabric dyeing workshop today. So I hope all of you guys have your materials ready. So um, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce you to Stephen Hamilton. And Stephen, I don't know if you wanna tell um, the audience a little bit about you and the work that you do here in Boston. Hello everyone. Um, so I am a artist and educator from uh, Boston, Massachusetts. Um, I was born in Roxbury, uh, raised in Roxbury. A lot of my work um, centers the incorporation of traditional West and West Central African artistic techniques with uh, uh, Western painting and portraiture. Um, I do a lot of work which incorporates all of these different techniques, but also uh, philosophy and aesthetics from pre-colonial West Africa. And talking about the relationship that exists between that and some great black experiences. Um, a lot of my work also focuses on ways in which I can share these art forms with um, people of African descent. So what does it look like to include people in the community in the process? What does it look like to uh, teach um, these art forms? And what does it look like for us as black people, except for us as people of African descent, to claim these art forms as part of our own um, cultural experience? So that in a nutshell is what I do, or at least what I try to do. Um, and can you tell the audience a little bit about how you got specifically into working with fabrics and textiles? So um, it's a really interesting thing. Uh, when I was in college, I actually went to school for illustration. Um, I teach in the illustration department at Mass Art now as well. But I was super into video games. I'm still super into video games and comics. And I wanted to create uh, comics and games about uh, pre-colonial West Africa. I was very inspired by the stories of somebody who was like a huge anime nerd. I loved how people incorporated um, all this art and tradition from like ancient cultures into the, the, the games and the comics they made. I was super big fan of, not fan of Naruto. I was super a huge fan of like uh, Soul Calibur, all these things that like incorporated these elements of culture. So I was really interested in like, okay, how do you design clothing? How do you design weapons? How do you design these environments? So um, one of the big things when you're designing a character is what are they wearing? So I was really interested in uh, African textiles and clothing. Um, and through like studying that, I became really interested in like how these objects and items were made. Uh, so when I had the opportunity to study uh, at the Nikkei Center for Art and Culture, you know, it was very important for me to learn these traditional art forms and being there and learning these art forms and learning how th these items are oftentimes not just clothing, or not just like uh, items of clothing or materials used to make clothes, that they represent like this entire aesthetic philosophical world um, that's very deeply ingrained in the cultural fabric of the uh, society that um, I was staying with, that I was living with for nine months. Um, I began to have a deeper appreciation for it. And I also began to learn a lot more about like how these different art forms, how these different materials are also related to our experiences as African Americans and people in diaspora, specifically around like the production of cloth and technologies associated with cloth manufacture of uh, cloth, like um, processing cotton and indigo, and how that was exploited on American plantations. So, like the the clothing and the cloth became um, incredibly important to my work, um, as well as like wood carving and other traditional arts. So um, that's sort of how I became really like attached to this as a process. Um, and then that's when I started rethinking how like these items can become part of the work.
And sorry, guys, I muted myself. If you're just joining us, welcome. Um, we are here with Stephen Hamilton. I am Ariel. I'm the arts engagement producer for The Artery. Stephen is going to be leading us very shortly through a natural fabric dyeing workshop. Um, I'm really excited to see how you use annatto seeds to dye fabric and come up with these really cool designs. Um, and I know people are probably really anxious to see that process. So I'm just gonna ask you one more question. And I just kind of want to hear from you about what it's been like to shift as an artist um, during this pandemic, obviously not just the coronavirus, but all of the things that are happening, the protests that are happening across the country, um, you know, uh, basically, you know, everything that's going on with police brutality and um, black folks here in America. So I just kind of want to hear about how you're shifting either your art practice or how you do art or how you share it. Um, yeah. So like, firstly, like with the pandemic, I think I'm very much a homebody. So um, the way that it most negatively impacted me was that my work was now a part of my home where I make my artwork, where I live my life was also where I was teaching classes and where I was like, I'm forced to like interact with people, uh, you know, sometimes in capacities that I, I really didn't want to. So like, you know, my home is like this like sort of safe space and now it's a place where you know, my job is. So I think that that was really difficult for me. In terms of all the stuff that's been happening with um, police brutality, I think what's, what's been difficult for me to process is like, this is something which is ongoing. This isn't something which just like, you know, just started up, you know, three months ago. It's just like, it's something which has become consistent, but because, you know, we're sort of stuck at home, we've become so bombarded by all of these images. Um, and it, it really forces me to think about like what what can I contribute to this moment? And I think um, in terms of my practice, what I think a lot about is I think a lot about blackness. I think a lot about um, what how do we define blackness, and also how do we think about our blackness as independent to whiteness and white supremacy, and how important that is in terms of us like understanding ourselves and understanding and imagining a world beyond white supremacy. So what is beyond white oppression? What is beyond the white gaze? And because so much of my work thinks about like these philosophical and aesthetic um, principles, which are very ancient, very old, very much tied to like these very old pre-colonial um, African civilizations, these very old ideas, um, it gives fertile space for us to imagine a black experience that's free of that particular type of oppression. Um, so, like the acts of weaving and dyeing and creating this latest series that I've been working on has really given me sort of like this opportunity to explore these theories of blackness and to really think about how I share that with the world. Um, so that's sort of like the space that I've been in. And also just thinking about like what are some ways in which I can contribute other than like donations um, to, right. you know, furthering that cause. Right. You know, what does it look like for me? to like add more transparency and add more like elements of generosity to how I share the work. Mm. These tutorials and things like that are, are ways in which I'm thinking about ways in which I can share um, these experiences as a way to, to, to help people think about those things. But also to think about how people can sort of think about the act of creativity as something revolutionary and radical and something right. that, that, that's you know, healthy for us in terms of our feelings. Um, and so, okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. So I'm going to jump off. And for everybody who's watching, now is a really good time to make sure you get everything together. Um, Steven has two camera angles set up for us, actually, so that you guys can get a better look of what he's doing. Steven, we did get one comment that it's hard to see you um, on the camera that you're currently on. So I don't know um, if maybe the lighting can get adjusted. Someone commented that you're backlit. So let's so see. What I can do, so what I can do is I can, uh, give me one moment. I'm going to bring it up. And for everybody who's watching, um, you should have your cloth ready. You should have your annatto seed ready. Um, and I don't know if um, everyone was able to access the materials that we're gonna be using for this workshop, but now is just a good time to get everything set up. You can see Steven has everything set up. Um, and 
Yes. Yes, Brandon. We're going to go ahead and see if we can get Steven readjusted. Thank you guys for pointing that out. Um, and again, we'll be adding another camera angle in just a second. Is this a little bit better? That is a little bit better. So I'm going to go ahead and take myself off and I'm going to add this other camera stream. And I think maybe people will be able to get a gist of how it'll look. Okay. Okay. Also, right. I can't see my head. What's most important is that Are your hands. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and jump off. Thank you to everybody who's joining us um, for this workshop. We're really excited. And if you think that we should do more of these workshops, um, or if you'd like to see more of them from us, please let us know. We're always really open to feedback. Um, and yeah, that's it. I'm going to let you take it away, Stephen. Okay. Awesome. Perfect. Perfect. All right. All right. Hello, everyone. So what we're going to do is we're going to get started with our Adire, um, uh, project. We're going to be doing, um, a, uh, Adire Oniko. Adire Oniko means, uh, to tie and dye. Uh, with raffia, we're going to be using um, this like plastic twine, which is in the materials list. But we're going to be doing basic dairy techniques using annatto seeds. So annatto seeds are um, from the annatto tree. If anybody has ever used that song, if anybody has ever um, like cooked with that, what makes like your food orange is annatto or achote. Um, so what we're going to do is we're, we're going to be using this as a dye. So a couple of things about natto that I just want to talk to you all about. So natto is a very, very color fat. It's a very, very wash fast dye, but it's not very light fast. So this is a dyeing project that's very fun and easy to use, um, but you are going to need to re-dye whatever you create in the following years because it's going to start to fade after a while. So what we're going to do now is we're going to prepare the dye. So what I've done is I've set up um, a small burner and I'm heating up some water now. You can go ahead and put um, your pot that's been filled with water um, on the stove. Um, you can begin heating that up. And what we're going to do is we're going to start um, producing the dye. We're going to start preparing the dye. So as this is heating up, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add about a cup of my annatto seed. So I'm just going to pour my annatto seed in there. You can use about a cup of that. And then I'm going to add it to my water. And what you're going to notice is that this annatto seed that you're adding, it's um, it's going to it's going to start turning your uh, water a little bit yellow. But what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to um, add uh, an alkali solution to change the pH of the water, um, so that it's uh, alkaline. So the thing about annatto is that the chemical Bixen isn't really soluble in water. So what you have to do is you have to transform it into more Bixen. And the way that you do that is by adding um, an alkali uh, material. So I'm using soda ash, but like the material that I asked you to get was super washing soda, which is the same thing, it's sodium carbonate. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna add about, um, you can add about uh, uh, a third of a cup of it um, you don't have to be super, super precise in your measurement, um, but you just want to add like at least a third of a cup or a fourth of a cup to your um, water. And as you mix that in, what you're going to notice is that the color is going to start to leach out of the seeds a lot more and it's going to turn a deeper orange. So what you're going to do is you're just going to leave that on your stove. You're just going to allow that to heat up to a light color. It doesn't need to be super, super hot, but you do want to keep the water um, like at least as hot as a, a hot bath um, to allow the color to sort of leach out. So what we're going to do now is we're going to start creating our ties. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples. So somebody asked how much water. So you want to have your pot at least halfway full um, or two thirds of uh, the way full. You don't want it to be filled all the way to the top because when you add your sample, when you add your cloth, it's going to overflow and you don't want it to overflow. You want to make sure that there's a good enough amount of water so that your cloth is covered by the dye, but you don't want to have too much water so that it overflows. So um, I have mine, uh, which is about um, two thirds of the, way, uh, of the way full, so it has enough room for me to um, add my cloth. So what I'm doing right now is I'm going to start adding my tie. So what I'm going to dye is I'm going to dye this T-shirt. I have a T-shirt that I'm going to dye. Then I have like this small, I have this small, um, I have this small sample of linen 
that I'm gonna die. I've already dyed this one, and this one is a little bit pink because I've already dyed it with um, uh, avocado seeds. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you how to do a couple of very basic techniques. So the first technique that I'm gonna show you is a technique um, that's very common in a lot of IDRA. It's very common um, in a lot of different uh, tie and dye techniques. So uh, this uh, technique in Yoruba is called emelo. And emelo means to coil up. So um, the reason why you say to, to coil up emelo is because you're basically taking your uh, twine, which in the old days would be raffia, and you're coiling it up the cloth um, to create uh, a circle pattern. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut a length of my plastic twine. I'm going to grab my napkin, my little piece of cloth, and I want this to be in the middle. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fold this in, I'm gonna fold this in, I'm gonna fold it twice. So I fold it once and then twice. And then I'm just gonna grab this point what I'm going to start doing is I'm going to start tying my tie. So the way that I'm going to start tying my tie is I'm going to just hold this. I'm going to create my first knot that I tie very, very tight. And then I'm just going to start tying it very tight. Around the cloth. And one thing that you're going to notice about how I'm tying this is that I'm tying it around, I'm wrapping it around, and then I'm tightening it, I'm wrapping it around, and then I'm tightening it. I'm continuing to tighten it each time I wrap it around. And how far down you wrap this alelo is how, how large the circle is going to be. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use, I'm going to come closer, to the camera, to one of the cameras. I'm gonna come closer to the camera here, if you can't see. So I've created my tie. I'm wrapping it around, I'm tightening it, I'm wrapping it around, and I'm tightening it, I'm wrapping it around, and tightening it. I'm continuing to tighten it as I move down the cloth. What matters most is that your ties are tight. If your ties are not, very close together, don't worry about it. What matters most is that your ties are very, very tight. So I'm wrapping it around and I'm making sure it's very tight. And one thing that you're gonna notice is that it's very stiff. It should feel very, very, very stiff. And the reason why you want it to be stiff is so that the dye does not penetrate. You don't want the dye to penetrate into the tied area. So once I've tied this very, very tight, once this is very tight, I'm just gonna tie it off. And there's a particular way that I like to tie it off. So if I have this much string, what I often do is I just bring it around and then I create a little bit of a loop. So you see this loop that I created? There's a loop that was created here. So I'm just gonna take this and I'm gonna make this loop. And then I'm gonna bring the other side around and then I'm just gonna tie it off. And when I tie it off, I wanna make sure that I double knot it. I wanna make sure that it's double knotted because I want it to be super, super, super tight. And that's my first elelo. And this elelo that I have, is directly in the middle. This elelo that I have is directly in the middle of um, this uh, cloth. It doesn't have to be in the middle of the one that you're making. You can play around with using um, multiple elelo on your cloth, but this is uh, the elelo that I made that's right in the middle of this cloth. All right, and I'm gonna check my dye. You should notice that your um, water should the, um, sort of should be orange right now. It should be turning orange as it heats up, as more of the dye like filters off into the water, it's going to become more and more orange. This is sort of periodically. All right, so I have this first one here. Um, now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create 
sort of a crumple pattern. And to make this crumple pattern, what I'm gonna do is traditionally what you do is you allow the cloth to be wetted. I have another pot that's filled with water. Um, this pot is also two thirds of the way filled with water. And I'm just gonna wet the cloth. And squeeze and wring it out like this. And this isn't this technique isn't really rocket science. All you're doing, if I lay this on this table, you'll be able to see what I'm doing. All that I'm doing, you should be able to see from the front camera. All that I'm going to do is I'm just going to crumple it up. So we see how this is crumpled up like this. I'm going to take another length of string. And I'm just going to tie it very tightly. So you see how I'm wrapping this around this area that I've already crumpled up, and I'm just tightly tying it. And what this is going to do is it's going to give me a more irregular pattern, almost like a cloud pattern. So once I have this completely tied off, I'm just going to keep it in my water. I want it to be in my water because I want to make sure that my cloth is very wet. It's already wet once I add it into my, I want it to be already wet once I add it into my water. So next I'm going to do my t-shirt. And the t-shirt, I'm going to use a variety of different techniques. I'm actually going to do a, my favorite technique, which is a flag fold technique. Um, so I'm going to create a flat flag fold, and then I'm going to create three LLO. So the way that I'm going to do this, I'm going to organize this in a way where you can see the whole t-shirt from the front camera. And if you ever see me walking around, it's just because, forgive me, I, I need a new phone. I have a little bit of you know, a janky phone setup, so I just need to make sure that my phone doesn't, um, I just need to make sure that my phone doesn't shut off on y'all. So, um, what we're going to do is we're going to do a flag fold here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fold the sleeves in. Do you see me folding the sleeves in? And then what I'm going to do after I fold the sleeves in, I'm going to fold it in half. So you see, I'm going to do this one more time for all of you. So I have the t-shirt flat. And this is actually the back of the t-shirt. I have the t-shirt flat. I'm going to fold the sleeves in. And then I'm going to fold it in half. And that should give me a rectangle. That should give me like a good rectangle. Now what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start folding it. Um, by uh, folding, folding it in the same way I would fold the flag. So I'm going to fold it. I'm going to take this corner here, and I'm going to fold it so that this corner is at the edge of the fabric, creating sort of a triangle at the end. And then I'm going to take that triangle, like the tip of that triangle, and I'm going to bring it up to the edge of the fabric right here. So you saw how we take that, took that triangle where the end is, and I'm going to bring it up to the edge of the fabric. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this triangle and I have to fold it, I have to fold it in a way where the tip of this is over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip it so that this triangle is under the cloth now. You see? So the uh, fiber twine will work. So traditionally you use raffia. So if you have um, hemp twine or Cecil twine that will work really well. What matters most is it's very tight. The reason why I use plastic twine is because that was actually super cheap. Um, and also because it's plastic, it's not going to absorb the dye. So I'm going to take the, again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, I have this end of the fabric here. 
and I'm going to flip it to the back. And then I'm going to bring it forward here. And then I have to finish off the triangle by taking this end and folding it back. And what you should end up with is a triangle. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do my anello, um, just like I did before. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that this anello, or chupa, chupa means moon, I'm going to make sure that this anello is on all three sides of this triangle. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this string, and instead of starting from the tip, I'm actually going to start but where I want this shape to end. So I'm going to tie it very, very tight first. Just double knotting it very tight. And then I'm going to wrap it around as tight as I can. So I'm going to start wrapping this around very, 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 very tight. And again, you want to test and make sure that everything is very stiff before you tie it off. So I tied it super, super tight. I wrapped it around very tightly. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to tie it off. Now what I'm going to do after I do that is I'm going to tie the other ends as well. So I'm going to cut off some more twine. I'm going to do all three sides. I'm also going to do this last side as well. to be very, 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 very tight. All right, so what I'm ending up with is this triangle, this three-pointed shape that has these three ties on each, on it. So there's a tie on each end. I'm going to soak this in my water. Now, in a lot of recipes, there's a lot of dye recipes that um, will tell you you need to use salt or vinegar. So um, this is the reason why. Salt and vinegar, what they do is they open up the fibers, especially for cellulose fibers that are, they tell you to use salt, because that's, that, what that's doing is that's opening up the fibers and allowing more of the, um, uh, the dye to seep in. So um, it can be helpful to add a cup of salt to your water um, that you're soaking this in. Um, sometimes people erroneously say that salt is going to make it more permanent, and it doesn't. Salt is not a mordant. Um, uh, mordant is a um, mordant is a, a mordant is um, an iron salt or a tannin, which uh, changes the nature of the fiber that you're using, so it's more receptive to dye, and the dyes are more permanent on them. Anato is what you call a direct dye, so anato like turmeric does not require any type of mordant. Um, uh, other dyes that don't require special types of mordant um, include bat dye. So indigo is a natural bat dye. So um, because of the nature of the dye, because you're altering the dye through a fermentation or reduction process, 
Um, once the dye oxidizes, it's no longer water soluble, so that's why it doesn't wash off. And the, um, anato is a direct dye, so you don't need to um, add any other additives to your um, to your water uh, or your dye bath other than the soda ash or um, other type of like sodium carbonate um, to make sure that the dye is um, is effective and it's active. Uh, so just giving you a little clarification on that. Um, I do use mordantin processes uh, with uh, tan natural tannins and alum. Um, but those are for dyes that require them. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to check my dye bag. A lot of this dye is coming out. I have like a rich orange color. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to allow this to pour out. So you see that orange color? So you see how orange the water is? I'm just going to allow that to continue to warm up. Now, once once your um, samples are very wet, once they absorbed a good amount of water, what you can do is you can start adding them to the dye bath. And I want you to see how immediately it's starting to change that color. So we're gonna add it to our dye bath. And we're gonna allow it to soak in that dye bath. And what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that it soaks in that dye bath for typically, like I like to soak it in there for about an hour. But um, uh, for the sake of this exercise, we're probably just going to leave it in there for about 10 or 20 minutes. What I'm going to do now is, um, if you notice that the color is not like orange enough, if you feel like it's not, if you notice it's not absorbing um, enough of the dye, or if what you have is a light yellow, what you might need to do is you might need to add a little bit more of the annatto seed. Um, so. Like if you need to, what you can do is while that water is still hot, you can add another like half cup of annatto seed. The annatto is a very, very strong dye. So um, I don't, um, like typically one cup will do for like the size of the amount of samples that we're doing. If you're doing um, like a larger sample, if you're dyeing multiple t-shirts, then it could be helpful to use about two cups of the annatto seed. Also, you could do something called an exhaust dye. And what an exhaust dye means is that if you're done dyeing uh, your first samples, you can reuse that same dye bath. You can reuse that same dye bath and get a lighter color with another, um, with another uh, uh, cloth sample. So what we're going to do is we're just going to let that sit there for about 10 to um, 20 minutes. You'll notice that the water is very, um, it's going to be very orange. You can see that my fingertips are starting to turn a little bit orange. Um, and we're just going to let that sort of simmer in the dye. We're going to let that simmer in the dye bath for about um, 10 to 20 minutes. Um, what I can do right now is if anybody has any questions, I can answer those questions. Another thing that I can do is I can also, if people had any, if people were confused about the tying, I could tie a couple of more samples or show you some more samples of dry cloth to sort of help you with that. Feel free to ask questions. Feel free to ask questions. So you will need to use a natural fiber. You cannot do this with um, spandex or nylon, nylon or polyester or acrylic fabrics or acrylic, acrylic um, fabrics. 
Uh, those are synthetic fabrics, they're plastics. So you have to use uh, special types of um, synthetic dyes in order for that to, to work. So it's not gonna work on that. If you have a blend, so if you have like a cotton poly blend or a cotton spandex blend, uh, that t-shirt is 5% spandex, that's fine. It just needs to be majority cotton or rayon or silk or wool. Another rule of thumb, typically wool and silk will take dyes better. So there are certain dyes which are only um, really active or effective on protein fibers. That means fibers that come from animals. So silks and wools. Um, some dyes are, are better for a cellulose fiber. So for example, uh, henna only really works on um, protein fibers. Henna, which creates a beautiful brownish red color, only really works on protein fibers. Safflower paint, there's a paint that you can get from safflower leaves, but that only works on, um, that only will work on uh, cellulose fibers. You'll only be able to get yellow from wool and silk. The only way that you can get that color once the wool and silk is for you to dye the cotton first, release the, the dye from the cotton, and then dye silk in it. So depending on the natural fiber that you're using, some dyes will work and some won't. But typically, um, rule of thumb, when it comes to natural dyeing, you have to use uh, natural fibers. Or if you're using blends, it has to be the majority of uh, natural fibers. Also, when you're using other dyes that are substantive um, dyes that require mordants, you'll have to use a different mordanting process. So um, again, uh, the workshops that I'm doing now are specifically, I designed these workshops specifically for people in my community. So um, I wanted to make sure that these dyes are very accessible to people in my community. So this dye that I'm using, Anato, you can buy at any bodega, any corner store. You know, I got this at Tropical Foods, um, which is like right up the street from my house. Um, I also use a lot of natural dyes that I can source um, from like local stores. So like um, you can buy henna, like because I'm from Roxbury, because I'm from a very diverse, uh, but very black neighborhood. Um, I go to African food stores to get henna and wache, which is um, a type of uh, burgundy colored dye that I use very often. Um, usually when it comes to other dyes like camwood or um, cola nut, um, I oftentimes will have to order those online uh, from botanical sources because I'm using mostly dyes in my own practice that are indigenous um, to Africa. A lot of them are marketed as dyes and marketed as like uh, herbal formulas. So I have to buy them online. So the terms that I use for the uh, coiling technique is called elelo, E-L-E-L-O, which means to coil up. The other term for that uh, pattern can be called uh, oshupa, which means moon. So elelo, to coil up, oshupa, which means moon. So elelo, again, means to coil up. And that um, is in Yoruba. So adire is the Yoruba term for tie and dye and other types of business dye. So this technique that I'm doing is called Adire oniko, so adire adi to tie, ire to color or dye, oniko with raffia. Iko means raffia. So adire to tie and dye, oniko with raffia. Um, so I was using twine, but it means uh, to tie and dye uh, with raffia. Then you have adire eleko, eleko means with uh, cassava paste. So that's when patterns are painted with cassava paste and then dye. Adire alabere, alabere with the needle, abere needle, alabere with the needle to sew. Adire alabere, adire that has been sewn with the needle and then done. So that's the terminology that I'm using because that's the terminology that was taught to me when I was uh, learning these art forms in Nigeria. So in Nigeria, these time dye techniques are restrictively used uh, for indigo. So that's the dye that they use for adire. If you uh, go to Sierra Leone, or if you go to Liberia or Mali, they call it gara. So gara is the word for indigo, the word for dye, and that's also used for tie and dye. And in those places, they use both idea, they use both indigo and they use cola nuts. So they'll use cola nut dyes with indigo. You know, some other areas will use, like in Central Africa, they'll do tie and dye with uh, camwood. So you'll get all these beautiful reds, and they'll use a uh, raffia cloth for the tie and dye. You know, they'll also use like um, iron tanning, which creates a black. So 
So the thing about turmeric and beets is you can't really make them permanent. Turmeric, the active dye is a carotenoid, which um, breaks down with light. So there's nothing you really can do to make it more permanent. What you can do is you can do an iron after bath, and that's going to turn it green, and it's going to make it a little bit more permanent, but it's still going to fade with light. Beets, the, the chemical in that which makes it red is not, is not light fat or wash class, so it's gonna fade over time and it's gonna break down over time. Um, if you want colors that are going to last longer, you're gonna to have to use other types of, um, other types of dyes. So uh, if people really wanna have a good yellow that's gonna last longer, what you can do is you can use goldenrod. So goldenrod is gonna make a stronger yellow dye. You're gonna to have to mordant your fabric first and then you're going to be able to dye it with goldenrod, which you can, you can collect in Boston. There's species of goldenrod that grow in Boston that you can collect and, and you can dye with. Uh, but you're going to have to use a mortar for the fabric first. You're gonna to have to soak it in a tannic solution overnight, and then you're gonna to have to soak it in alum overnight, and then you can dye with it. Um, if you want a good red, a red which is gonna last a while, um, typically, you can use matter, which you can buy online. That's going to more than good cloth. They use matter root is going to work really. It's going to work really well. Um, another thing that you can do if you have silk or wool, this will work best on silk or wool. Is what you can do is you can use hibiscus. So all of us who are who who know about sorrel and drinking sorrel, that um, hibiscus like drink can be used as a dye. But what you have to do is you have to. So you have to mordant your fabric. So if you have wool or silk, you mordant your wool or silk with alum and um, cream of tartar. And then after you mordant your wool and silk, you can dye it yellow with your golden rod. And then you can over dye it with your um, hibiscus and it'll give you a deeper red. And you're most likely gonna have to dye it multiple times. So if you want to use something which you can get from the grocery store or you can sort of like scavenge yourself, then that's the process. Like, if you're concerned about like, okay, I don't want to order things online and it's too expensive, you want to use a mortising process um, for uh, a silk or wool, you can go to like a local food store, especially if it's an African food store or um, like a Caribbean food store and you can buy alum. Alum is a common food um, treating, it's used for food treatment, it's used to clean and purify water, it's used to clean snail, you can usually buy it. I buy all of my alum from Tropical Foods. And you can use that to mordant fabric. So you can take your cotton, you can take your wool or your silk, and you can um, you, you boil up the alum in some water, you simmer it for about an hour, like your, your silk and your wool for about an hour. You let it sit in the bath overnight, you take it out, you rinse it, and then when you dye with it, like that hibiscus will be more permanent. If you wanted to use that on cotton, you would have to use tannin. So you could use uh, black tea. Um, a very good tannin that is in Boston is sumac. And what I can do is I can try to show a video of like collecting sumac. I've used it as a mordant, it works really beautifully. Um, you would take su sumac leaves, dry them, then you would boil them. You would soak your fiber in that overnight, your cotton in that overnight. You would take it out, rinse it, then you would uh, uh, simmer it in alum and let that sit after overnight after that. And then you could dye with hibiscus and you'll get a nice pink with that that's a bit more permanent. The only problem with hibiscus is it's a pH indicator. So if you ever dye with hibiscus, make sure that you're not washing it in the alkaline soap or it's going to turn it. That was a very long winded answer to your question, but like, but that's the thing. Like, turmeric is a very good dye, but it's meant to be dyed over and over again. So if you dye it with turmeric, just be prepared to dye it again and again. Same thing with anatto, be prepared to dye it again. You want um, a, a yellow that's going to last a long time. You're going to either have to use um, a mordant, and then you like use a goldenrod or weld. Weld doesn't really grow in America, so it doesn't really grow in, in where we live. So you would have to like order that online. Or what you can do is you could find like um, a tannin. So like tannic yellows, yellows that are very rich in tannin. Um, can uh, plants that are very rich, rich in tannin? That's the cause of like that, that yellow color can be a little bit more permanent as well. Like that tumor is going to have to die a little bit. Are there any other questions?
So there are some species of goldenrod that I've seen. I have to double check, I believe that it was goldenrod um, that I uh, saw growing near the fens. So um, there's some goldenrod which um, is growing near the fens. Um, there's also, uh, if you go like outside of Boston, there are some areas like outside of Boston, some green areas outside of Boston where you can find goldenrod growing um, in the late summer, like early summer. So this is absorbing some really nice color. Some really, really nice color. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take this off. If your water is very hot, what you want to do is you want to allow the water to cool first. You want to allow the water to cool first before you stick your hand in the dye. You want to make sure you're wearing gloves. The dye isn't going to damage your hand, but it is going to turn your hands um, orange. So you're going to remove it from the heat. And again, this dye that I have, it's not too hot. I can put my hand in it. But what you need to do is you need to not burn yourself. You need to make sure that the water, that the water is, the dye is cooled off before you take it out. So what I'm going to do to help clean this, and I also want um, to brighten the color a bit, a little bit, is I'm just going to take um, a little bit of white vinegar. I use white vinegar when I'm dying with turmeric because, like in the video that I posted online, I was dying with, with um, turmeric and uh, annatto. So if turmeric comes into contact with any base, any alkaline solution, it's going to start turning red and staining red. So to neutralize that, you need to use like an acidic solution. So making your water a little bit acidic would fix that discoloration. Anato isn't going to be discolored by, um, by alkaline, but what, what I'm doing is I'm adding that to brighten the color a little bit. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take my sample out and see how beautifully, beautifully orange this is. So I'm going to put it in this water. Now I'm going to rinse it. If you have a washing machine, what you can do, and it will work really, really beautifully, is you can um, you can run it through. Just add a little bit of vinegar to your um, to, to um, a rinse cycle, and it's going to give you. Um, it's going to like rinse it really good. If y'all want like deeper colors, what I would suggest that you do is you allow it to sit in the annatto a little bit longer. For the sake of this um, exercise, I took it out up after like, um, like 10, 15 minutes. But um, if you want really good results, I would leave it in there um, for at least an hour. And once you've rinsed this out, now here comes the fun part. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to cut this tie for the first sample that we tied. I'm also going So this is the first sample that I tied. See this lovely orange color in the pattern that I got.
So we can see the allele pattern in the middle and then that crumble pattern all the way on the outside. And this came out a lighter color because this is actually a linen blend. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut the t-shirt that I made. Be careful not to, when you're cutting the ties, not to cut the fabric. And what you should end up with is a very nice kaleidoscope pattern. Inter another important thing to understand about Anato is Anato is a dye which is indigenous to the Americas. So a lot of indigenous people in the Americas were using Anato not only as a dye for fibers, but also um, as a cosmetic, um, as a medicine, there's a lot of like interesting and beautiful uses of these dyes as medicines and also as like um, sacred substances which are used to dye and color the skin. A lot of energizing tonics used by indigenous people incorporate anato in them. And it also has a very beautiful and healing smell. It has an earthy sweet smell. So this is the t-shirt, and you can see this kaleidoscope pattern that has been created on this t-shirt. And this is fairly washed back, so you can put it in your washing machine, but it is not very light fast. At the end of the summer, at the end of the summer, you are going to need to probably over dye this again. And that concludes our workshop. This is a very simple, easy workshop that you can do with young people. All of these ingredients you can typically buy from a grocery store. All of this stuff like is available. I could buy that this at Tropical Foods. Um, like you can also use uh, fibers that you have at home. So you could use this to revitalize like old clothing. Iberia in ancient times uh, was used by the Arab people to make old cloth look new. They would take their old wrappers and clothing and um, tie them and dye them to create uh, beautiful um, renewed uh, uh, fabric. So it's very much um, a technique which could be used to revitalize and renew old clothing. Um, and um, if you're unsure about what your fibers are made out of, you can check out my Instagram and the IGTV. I show you how to do a burn test to figure out what um, fibers are made out of so you can make sure you have fibers that are going to take the dye away. Thank you. Thank you. I hope that you all enjoy your shirts or your samples. For people who are also indigo dyers, people who are also indigo dyers, I love over dyeing um, anato with indigo. It is a thing that I do very often. This here is a reproduction of a uh, writer's jacket. In West Africa and Sahelian re regions, um, warriors, mountain warriors would wear these uh, writer's jackets. So what I did is I made one out of um, cotton that uses um, anato that's been also over dyed with uh, cola nuts and dipped in iron to make it brown and then over dyed it with indigo to get these very nice green colors. So, for all people who are also indigo dyes, it's really cool to over dye it with indigo. And the cool thing about it is, like, once the anato fades, you can dye the entire thing with anato again to refresh the color. All right, everyone, does anybody have any other questions for me?
Another thing that Anato is really good for is like whenever you have dyes that are not for all people who are like fashion designers or people who make clothes for people, whenever you have dyes that aren't very light fast, a very, a very good way of dealing with that is by using them as linings. So uh, safflower, which makes a beautiful hot pink, is not very light fast at all. It fades and like very rapidly. And the solution for that was to use them as the inside um, linings of uh, kimonos in Japan. So um, it can be a good uh, use of, of, of this dyeing technique if you want to have like these really beautiful bright orange linings that you sort of catch a flash of as you move around in like jackets and things like that. Um, so like that's another way of dealing with that. Um, it doesn't matter. Uh, what I would do to make sure that it doesn't run um, is that I would uh, I would rinse it first and then untie it and rinse it again. If you keep your fabric, like that fabric that I had was very wet and it was balled up. If you keep that um, tied for a long time, it's gonna get mildew. It's gonna, like mildew's gonna start growing on it. So um, I would suggest that you um, rinse it, untie it, and then um, rinse it again. Typically what I try to do is I, I, if I'm, if I'm um, if I have something that I'm tying and I'm dying and I have to leave it tied because I'm dying it again, um, I try to make sure that I do that the next day so that there's no mold in it. Uh, rider's jacket, so for horsemen. So uh, there was like a very, very like rich uh, cavalry culture in West Africa. Um, fascinating history of that. Wolof, Lani, Hausa, Kanuri, um, Mandinga uh, warriors like um, uh, used horses. Horses were used also by the Yorubas. The horse has a long history in, in Africa and like as a symbol for uh, uh, conquest and for um, warrior traditions uh, that's that's very popular. Like the images of the Elishin, which are the, the, the horsemen, or the Jan uh, which are like the warriors. So um, what they would wear is they would wear these riders' coats. And they were typically made out of hand-woven fabric and they were like these long sleeve long like coats that um, mounted horsemen would wear. So they're riders' jackets. Some of those riders' jackets were quilted. So um, you see sometimes in old photos of these warriors wearing these like beautifully quilted like armors uh, that are, are used as, as jackets. Um, so yeah, that, that's what that is based on. And I think that's it. I think I don't see anyone else having questions. I think is everyone good? Um, does anybody else have any more questions for Steven before we go ahead and close out the workshop? No, there's a ton of comments. Um, thank you guys. I think, uh, Steven, it seems like people found this really, really um, informative and helpful. We're getting a lot of great comments about, um, yeah. Oh, thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Lisa. All right, and I think that's it. I don't see any more comments coming in. Um, so Steven, yeah, I just wanna say thank you so much. I learned so much just listening to you. I had no clue about like half the terms you were using. If you need me to clarify, if people need me to clarify anything, I, I'm more than happy to clarify. Yeah, I mean, you. Um, in the gist of like the conversation, it makes sense, you know what I mean? Um, I just need to like probably re-up on my science terms. Um, someone commented and they said, uh, Christine Cavaccio said, um, they hope that you can do more workshops. And actually, Stephen, you are planning on doing more workshops, right? Yes. So um, I'm doing, I have online workshops that are available um, on my IGTV. It's always like free. The first one is um, dying with turmeric and motto. Uh, all of the workshops are. Um, just out of full transparency, the reason why I developed the workshops were, was um, 
you know, ways in which uh, uh, black and brown families can engage in creative activities um, because of the COVID crisis. So all of the dyes and materials that I use are all things that you can buy from grocery stores that can be purchased in our communities. So because that's who it's for, that's what those techniques are always going to center. Um, so um, that's just a full disclaimer of what the workshops are and what they're about and what I'm going to cover in them. Um, I, I put three videos on there. The first is the burn test. The second is a um, the second is a uh, is dyeing with turmeric and natto, which gives you yellow and orange. Okay. Um, so like those are available, and more are going to be posted on um, later. The next one that I'm working on is um, a uh, uh, lecture on African textiles, specifically for consumers. Like what are African textiles? What are some myths of it? You know, some myths and realities about African textiles. Um, also, disambiguating sort of the, the ethical use of African textiles, specifically in the diaspora. Hopefully, I can get insight on that. Um, there are other workshops that I want to do, but they are going to be closed because they aren't really specific. So, I do, I am thinking about doing a do rag tutorial, like teaching people how to make hand sewn do rags, but that's going to be a closed one. So, that's going to be like a Zoom class. Um, but, um, yeah, they are on my IGTV if you want to watch them. Yes, and for anybody who wants to follow Steven, we do have his handle right here, but I've also linked um, in the comments to his Instagram. And as he said, he does have those IGTVs up where he um, really goes in depth, as you all of you can see, into what types of fabrics you should be using, why, what types of dyes you should be using and why. Um, and if you're not already following Steven, you definitely should be because he has a wealth of knowledge, not just about textiles, but about art and history um, in general. And I love learning from you and I'm so happy that we were able to get you for today. Thank you so much, Steven. Thank you so much. Thank you for including me. And thank yeah. you all for patiently, patiently listening to me for yeah, I mean, it didn't last that long, only an hour, right? Um, so, and if you've been working on this workshop with us, please tag us in your final results. Um, you can find the artery at WBUR Artery on both Twitter and Instagram. And please tag um, Stephen at the Art of Stephen Hamilton on Instagram and let us know how your final results came out. And um, again, if you want to see more workshops like this from the artery, please let us know. Um, you can email me at agray510 at bu.edu um, if you ever want to give us some feedback. And yeah, we're just getting more feedback. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Christine. Um, and yeah, I think I think that's it. I think we're going to conclude for today. And we both hope that you guys really enjoyed this. Steven, thank you so much. You are very, very welcome. Thanks. Bye, everybody.